Turn with me, if you will, to session six, which is proclaiming the good news. And let me start by telling you a story. Years ago, I was talking to one of my grandfathers, and he's a very religious man, uh, grew up in the church, a mainline denomination. It's the denomination that I grew up in. And so he always liked to engage in religion, religion and uh, he liked to debate about these different things, and we used to always get into these arguments with my brother and I as well. So I remember one time I was having a conversation with him, and usually people would start to leave the room, like other family members would start to leave the room, and we'd have these conversations. But I remember I was in the conversation with him, and he said that he had never sinned, uh, that he, he really had never sinned. And um, so I said, well, that's, you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, did you know that the Bible says that he who says he's without sin is a liar and there's no truth in him? So that didn't go over very well. Um, you know, call me a liar and all that stuff. Uh, I was young in my Christianity as well, so I had a lot of zeal without knowledge. But, um, and then I asked him this question, though. I said this. I said, Granddad, I said, if you have never sinned, then why did Jesus die such a horrible death on the cross? And again, this man had been in the church for forever. He was a lay Eucharistic minister. He was very involved in our church. And I asked him, I just said, why? Why did Jesus die such a horrible death on the cross? If you're good enough to get to God, why did he do that? And he looked at me with a straight face and he said, I don't know. And I said to him, I said, you know, that's actually a good answer. Because if you're good enough to get to God, you have no need for a Savior, and certainly not a crucified Savior that died on the cross. So you can see, I hope from that story, you can see how important it is for us to understand the bad news. Without it, the good news makes no sense, and my grandfather was proof of that. But we don't simply want to give people bad news and leave them there. We want to tell them the good news as well, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this session. In the last session when you were practicing, maybe you hit some snags. I want to give you some tips that might help you as you're presenting this book. The first is to hold this booklet so it can be clearly seen. If you're sharing it with someone, you don't want to kind of put your nose down and start reading it, Jesus lived a sinless life. You want to hold it so that they can see it as well. Jesus lived a sinless life. So that's an important tip. Also, read the booklet aloud word for word. If you want to interject an illustration or a comment, don't do it mid-paragraph. Finish a paragraph, and then you can interact and make that comment so that people aren't figuring out, am I looking here, am I looking at you? Read through that paragraph and then interact. Also, use a pen to help you focus on key points. It can be very helpful just to show somebody where you're reading or to say, could you read this verse? It also helps you to check things off or to circle things like we did uh, for the Ten Commandments. So a pen can be helpful for that. If there's no response or if someone seems extremely quiet, you can just stop and ask them, say, is this making sense? And sometimes they'll say no. You can go back and review those parts that didn't make sense. You don't have to be in a rush to try to get it all done. Um, you can go back and clarify those things. Sometimes have the listener uh, read the scripture. So there's two places that I tend to do it. You can do it right here uh, in Jesus' death in this section. And then also um, I'll do it on this spread as well in this Romans 2 verse. So you can do it in both those places and say, could you read this for me? That's sometimes a helpful thing to do. When questions arise that would change the subject, I would suggest that what you do is say, that's a good question. Could we talk about that at the end after we've been through the whole booklet? That way you'll know what Christianity teaches. That can be a helpful thing so that you get through the topic, uh, so that you get through the booklet and stay focused on the gospel. And if a person shows significant interest, it's also helpful to exchange information. If you can exchange emails, that's a great way on a safe way to communicate uh, with someone. You can go back and forth with them. And also be sure to pray for someone uh, if you've had a conversation with them. Now on the top of the next page, we're going to start this walkthrough again of the How Good Are You booklet, focusing on the good news section. 
as we mentioned in the previous session, these are just tips. Uh, they're tips that we think will help you. You don't have to use any of them. If it was your first time using this booklet, you might feel like, oh no, I, I forget which page do I turn back and where do I underline and what scriptures they read. Don't worry about that. Just go ahead and get started. And as you get comfortable, you can refer back to your manual and add some of these tips in that you might find effective. So we're on number two there. You'll see it says God's solution. So we first talked about the problem. Now we get to the good news. We get to God's solution. It says that Jesus lived a sinless life. And it's important that you understand the significance of that when it comes to the gospel. Do you understand how important his sinless life was, the righteousness of Christ? Jesus actually obeyed all the commandments. He kept every law. He never broke any of them. He lived a sinless life. And that's critical when it comes to the gospel because without a sinless life, we would have no substitute, no sacrifice. You know, in the Old Testament times, uh, they had to sacrifice different animals, sheep, lambs, goats, etc. And those animals often were year-old males without defect. They had to be perfect. They had to be pure, as if there was no sin. Why? Because they were a substitute. They were taking your place. If you asked me to be a substitute for your sins, to die for your sins, I couldn't do it because I had I have my own sins. My own sins need to be paid for. What you need is someone without sin so that they can take on your sin. If they have sin, they have to pay for their own sin. It can't work. You need someone that is sinless. You need someone who is righteous, and that was Jesus Christ. His righteousness is critical to salvation. We're unrighteous. And Christ transfers that righteousness or imputes that righteousness to us. So in the first sentence, it says, Jesus lived a sinless life. In love, Jesus died as a substitute for our sins. And then God's love, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It says, even though we turn against our creator, he loves us. Again, there's that creator language. He's the creator, we're created, and we're turning against the one that we're ultimately responsible to. So even though we turn against our creator, he loves us and sent his son Jesus to save us from his judgment. On the cross, God the Son endured the holy wrath we deserve so that we could be forgiven and accepted by God. The reason that we're using that acceptance language, you might recall, in the very beginning of the track, we said, God knows I'm a pretty good person, and because of this, he will accept me into heaven. But is that true? And so we return to that theme all the way back here, and we say that God in the Son endured the holy wrath of God so that we could be forgiven and accepted by God. And we see that pictured very graphically here as this cross has bridged the gap between us and God. You also know, and sometimes I'll even point this out, the flames are being absorbed by the cross. So, so that punishment, uh, those fires of, of hell even, are being absorbed by the cross. And that's a good way of looking at what Christ did on the cross. He absorbed the punishment that we deserve. So it's kind of graphically pictured there. And then I'll often uh, just move to this next page, and you can have them read this verse, or you can read it yourself. Um, it says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Now, this is often where people can get tripped up. They don't really understand that. So sometimes I'll underline the word righteous and the word unrighteous, and I'll just ask them, do you know who the righteous are? And normally people will say, um, uh, well, that's you. <laughs> and, and then you have an opportunity to say, no, no, that's not me. I'm, I'm not the righteous. The righteous that you're referring to is Jesus. And do you know who the unrighteous is? And just asking them so that they understand that that's us. It's not just him or them. It's, it's me too. We're the unrighteous. But through Jesus' death, he brings us his righteousness. And then often I'll just draw a little arrow. You can see it in your manner. Just a little arrow kind of um, 
kind of jumping the guy across to get to God. One of the other things that you can do that's very effective is, um, again, you don't have to do this. It's just another tip. But you can turn back to the law and say that we are unrighteous. Uh, We're the ones that have broken the law. But Christ kept all these commands. He has no check marks, no sin. And because of that, we can come to God through him. This cross makes a bridge for us to be accepted by God. So that's that page, and then we can keep moving on. For this page, we usually just read straight through this. Jesus is alive today. After three days in a tomb, Jesus rose from the dead and was seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses. Having conquered sin and death, he returned to heaven and now reigns as ruler over all. And then right there under the tomb, it says, it's not enough to simply know these truths. And that's important. Christianity is not about an intellectual assent to a body of information or facts. It actually requires a response from us. And we see that on the next page. That's our third point, which says your response. It says you must turn from your sins and trust in Jesus alone. Only then will you be forgiven and accepted by God. What we're trying to get at here on this page is that our response requires repentance and faith. And that's what we get to in these next verse. Turning from sin, that's another way of saying repentance. It's not just being sorry, but it's turning from sin. Acts chapter 3 there, it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That's capturing repentance. And then trusting in Jesus, that's another way to say faith. John chapter 3, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Then I move to the top of the next page. It says, what's your response? If you're trusting in yourself, you decide what is right and wrong and how to live. You are in the driver's seat. If you're trusting in Jesus, he defines what is right and wrong and how to live He is in the driver's seat. So which car are you in? Now, sometimes people, it's a great question. You want to give people time to think about this. Which car are you in? You see this one car. This guy's driving it all by himself. He's in the red car. He's in control of his life. He's making decisions and deciding how he wants to live, where he wants to go with with little reference to God. In this car, Jesus is in the driver's seat. He's the one that's in control. He's the master. He's the Lord. He's the treasure. And so we're just kind of riding shotgun there. The little guy's kind of just waving to us. So which car are you in? And it can take some time for people to think through this. I'm not really sure I'd like to be in the white car. I'm not. Maybe I'm not. And sometimes people will even say, well, I think maybe like probably maybe like a middle car. And I've had people say this. It's great, actually, when they say this. They say, well, maybe if my car had me in the driver's seat and Jesus in the passenger seat. You know, Jesus will ride shotgun. You know, Jesus is my co-pilot kind of thing. Um, And one of the things I'll tell people, which usually um, silences people pretty quickly on this issue, is I'll tell them that the Bible says there's no such car. In fact, um, if there were that car, it would be called hypocrisy. Someone who appears to be following Christ, but really is just following themselves and just trying to get Jesus to come alongside. And this can be a difficult point for people to understand. You know, a lot of people today will understand uh, repentance. They understand maybe they've sinned and maybe they've sinned against God and they need to repent from that and turn away. It can be hard for folks to trust in Christ. When you say that you need to give your life to Christ, You know, people have maybe trusted others and been hurt in the past. And now you come along and say, you need to trust Christ and give him your entire life. You need to make him your highest treasure and surrender the steering wheel of your life over to him and allow him to be in control. People don't like that. They're they're more comfortable saying, "Uh, well, maybe Jesus can just sit, you know, I'll steer and he can maybe help me if I take a wrong turn or if I crash, I'll just have Jesus kind of come along. Jesus doesn't accept that. 
either we're driving that car or we've surrendered to him. And that's what we're trying to get at here, counting the cost. There is a cost to giving our lives to Christ. It's free, it's by grace, but it costs us. We must surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. So you can read that. Which car are you in? They might say middle car. You could say, well, the Bible has some strong words for middle car. It's called hypocrisy. So really, there's only two cars. So which car are you in? And regardless of what they say, or maybe they pause, you can also say, which car would you like to be in? So maybe they say, I'm in the red car. You can then say, well, which car would you like to be? And they say, well, I'd like to be in the white car. Um, and then you can even just ask them there, well, why, why do you want to switch? Why do you want to go from this red car to the white car? And sometimes if people, a lot of people, they really want to get in that white car. Sometimes I'll just ask them, well, why do you think you're in that white car? Um, what do you think it means? And, and so that'll give you a chance, again, to ask questions and to interact with them. And then if you turn to the next page, it says, Jesus is calling you to trust him. You can do that right now. Read over the prayer below to see if it expresses the desire of your heart. If it does, pray to God with faith and he will save you. So let me just read over this. It says, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm not good. I've broken your laws and lived my own way. Thank you for living a perfect life and dying as my substitute. Today, I turn from my sins and trust in you for God's forgiveness and acceptance. Now, after you read that, one of the things that you can say is, does that, does that express the desire of your heart? And if it does, that's a good time to actually lead them in prayer. One of the other things you could do is just read this verse, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And it's helpful to read that so that they can see that we're saved by grace through faith and not as a result of works, and not as a result of saying a prayer. It's grace that saves us. And so you can model this prayer for them, read through it, ask them if it expresses the desire of the heart, and then allow them to pray. The next page, it talks about church. It says, if you did just trust Jesus. So the first one said, if you're not ready. Now this one says, if you are ready. If you just trusted Jesus, that's great. Please know that God doesn't expect you to live out the Christian life on your own. He's designed the church to be a dynamic, life-changing community where you'll be cared for and encouraged. Take the next step. Find a good church where the Bible is clearly taught and its truths are lived out with passion and authenticity. We'd love to have you join us or help you in your search. And then real small there, it says, see back cover. And so that takes them uh, to the invitation, to the church invitation. And the page before that um, takes them to the Alpha Spread. And you can show them about the Alpha course and there's website and all kinds of information that is found there. the good news okay. that goes along with it. First of all, I'll tell you the mistake that you can make. The mistake you can make is to see that bad news and say, well, I'm going to try harder and maybe I'll try to do good from now on. Okay. I would just strongly encourage you to think about that. You can never undo all the wrongs you've done in the past. And even if you're perfect from here forward, mm -hmm. the laws have been broken and the punishment is deserved. Mm -hmm. So if I try to do that, it can't possibly work. Mm -hmm. But if I just admit and accept what God says I deserve, then he tells me about this amazing thing that he did to solve the problem. Jesus came and lived a sinless life, so he lived the way we're supposed to live, like you were saying. But not only that, it's love, then Jesus died as a substitute for all of our sins. So, John 3.16, do you know what that one is? Yeah, What's that's that? the one uh, I gave my only son 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Even though we turned against our Creator, He loves us and sent His Son Jesus to save us from His judgment. See, for Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous, meaning Jesus, for the unrighteous, meaning you and me. He did that to bring you to God. Do you know who the righteous is in this one, Kirsten? The ones that believe. Look again. Okay. It's Jesus. It says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous one, Jesus, or the unrighteous. Do you know who that's referring to? The sinners. Yeah, everyone he brings to God. For all of us. Particularly Christians. You know, like, it's not like Christians are righteous and earn their way to God. It's that the righteous one, Jesus, died for them, the unrighteous. On the cross, God the Son endured the holy wrath we deserve so that we could be forgiven and accepted by God. Before there was a separation between us and God, we can't get to God, but God loves us. He's the way. Jesus is the way. Exactly, to bring us to Himself. But what Jesus did on the cross was enough to satisfy the Father, to satisfy Him, to wipe away your sins, and to make you acceptable to Him. And the amazing thing is that Jesus is alive today. After three days in the tomb, Jesus rose from the dead and was seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses. Having conquered sin and death, he returned to heaven and now reigns as ruler over all. It's not enough just to know these things. We talk about it. That's one thing. But you have to respond to them. And so the Bible says that you must turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. Only then you'll be forgiven and accepted by God. Here's the next scripture. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So it's kind of like repentance is like, we're going our own way, and then we say, no, I want to follow, I want to follow what you want for my life. So here's kind of a way to measure your response, thinking about it. If you're, if you're trusting in yourself, then you're deciding what is right and wrong. You decide how to live. You are in the driver's seat, okay? If you're trusting in Jesus, then he's defining what's right and wrong, and he decides how you live. He's in the driver's seat. So that's how you can tell, well, am I really trusting in Jesus or am I trusting in myself? So, Brian, which car do you think that you're in? I'm in a red car. I'd say I'm in the red car, but I don't know. I think I'd be going off somewhere else. Who would you say at this point in your life would be in the driver's seat? Hopefully, hopefully, yeah, uh, Jesus is with me. Well, I mean, I can't say that because I don't believe, I believe our law is God. Okay. I, I believe that Jesus Christ is a prophet. So, Pearson, which car would you say you're in right now? I personally think I'm in the white car, but other people would say different. At this point, I guess I'm in the red car. Okay. So, but, uh, I mean, after listening to you, yeah. Oh, I guess consider the white one. If you're considering the white sure, one. Sure, I'll, I'll think about it. Yeah. Uh, Now, we're going to break down and role play once again. And what I'd like to ask you to do is uh, to partner up and actually go through the entire track. So last time we just went through the bad news. We want you to start at the beginning again and head all the way through. It can be a little bit easier to do the good news, but we want you to get practice in the bad news and, and head all the way through that. But before we do, I thought it might be helpful to kind of finish my story, my testimony that I started with, uh, with Alvaro. You remember my friend Alvaro, who shared the gospel with my brother and I. Well, he, he gave us a Bible, and my brother and I were fighting over this Bible, and somehow we got a hold of another, another Bible, and we began to read it. And I went off to college. My brother and I went to separate colleges. And I was, I was very much into the world. I was into um, parties and relationships and those sort of things. And I remember in my room, I was really into uh, the band Led Zeppelin and classic rock. So I literally had like an entire shrine to them. I had all these different posters up and, and all this different stuff. But I had in my room, in the midst of all that ungodly stuff, I had my Bible. I had a Bible. And every night when I was a freshman, I would pull that Bible off the shelf and I would read for an hour every night. I would read from 12 midnight to 1 in the morning. I was a college student, so I didn't have that much to do. So I could stay up late. So I, I would read that Bible, and I started in Genesis, and I actually, in a few months, went all the way through 
that Bible. Now, also, early on in the semester, I started to date this girl. And I didn't have my friend Alvaro. He went to a different college, so I didn't have him. I had nobody to ask questions. I was reading through this Bible, but I didn't know who to turn to. Well, my girlfriend's roommate was a Christian, and I could tell because of the the posters and things on her wall. So I just began to bombard her uh, with questions. I would just say, hey, I was reading this, and what do you think about this? And and she was, she was really knowledgeable, so she would help me a ton. And I really looked forward to going over there and talking to her. When I would leave, my girlfriend would always ask her, why does he always ask you these religious questions? And she was like, I don't know why. And, uh, but she did a great job answering. And she invited me out to a meeting uh, called Fellowship of Christian Athletes. It was a fellowship there on campus. And I remember going to that meeting, and I was nervous. You know, when I first went there, I thought, uh, you know, I really don't, I feel uncomfortable. These people are clapping and raising hands and, and you know, but they seem nice, but they seem weird. Uh, and they're more weird than nice, so I'm done with them. So, so that was it. I just went and visited um, once. And this was my, um, my uh, girlfriend's roommate had invited me to come out. And so I thanked her and then, and that was it. So I went through the, ne- the rest of that semester, my first semester, freshman year, I'd read all the way through the Bible. I started up again. I think I started up again in the New Testament. And the more that I read that Bible, the more that I I saw that the things that Alvaro was saying were true, that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. And I just found, as I read that Bible, I just found faith growing in my heart. I found affection that I, I began to grow just in my love for this person, for this Savior. And I also began to see that, that I was a sinner and that there was no way for me to be good enough to get to God. And so I remember that night in April of 1989, um, I had broken up with my girlfriend. Her roommate invited me back out to FCA. I remember going back in second semester and I walked back into the meeting and all of a sudden I saw some people that I knew that I wouldn't have thought belonged in that meeting, but they were there. And so I was like, hey, what are you doing in here? And, and they're like, well, what are you doing in here? And I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm doing in here. And so, but I made connections and they actually invited me to come play on some of their sports teams. And so I began to, to build some friendships over the next month or so. And I continued to read the Bible. And then I remember in April of 1989 being in that meeting and a guy, I don't even know who he was. I, I've never seen him. Uh, before I've never seen it I haven't seen him since and he he was just a guest speaker a young guy that that got up and he preached the gospel and he preached it powerfully and clearly and God grabbed a hold of my heart and I, and I remember the wrestling I remember wrestling there thinking what about my friends what about the parties what about these things and saying but yeah but I know that Christ is real I know that he's the Savior I know I need to turn from my sins. And by God's grace, He grabbed my heart. He regenerated me. And I responded by repenting and trusting in Him. And my life has never been the same since. And I'm amazed. I'm amazed to stand before you. I'm amazed that God has done so much. And I give Him all the glory for all that He has done.